7 p.m. Hello, ma'am. This is uh, Mr. Sturkey from Verizon. Just give me a call back. I'm sorry I didn't follow up with you on Saturday, but I checked your account. Your bill had not printed yet. Um, as far as now, your bill has printed, so I'll try to give you a call back um, later this week. If I don't get you, I'll give you a call on Saturday again then. Um, I did talk to our uh, media relations department. They were interested I mean, possibly doing something. They just needed to know uh, the name of your show and what network it was on, which that's information I didn't have. Um, so I'll give you a call back, and we can see if we can arrange that as well. So I will give you a call back. Thank you so much. Sorry, again, sorry I didn't get to you on Saturday. To hear received Wednesday, April 13th at 4.07 p.m. Hello, ma'am. This is Yeah. So you just press it and then you want. Here, can you introduce it? Huh? Here, I'll introduce it. You can look at the car in the back. Alright. Uh, you gotta get closer because you want to hear it. Okay. We have a, a, a special guest. We have Gene Keating on with us tonight. He's going to cover a lot of topics. Um, he said he's going to talk, cover tax law, commercial law, accounting law, trust law, adverse claims, and void judgments. Uh, he's going to touch on those and explain a little bit uh, about those and why we're not winning in our cases. Hi, Gene. How are you? I'm fine. Great. Great to have you with us. Um, for those that don't know you, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Just a little intro. Mostly everybody knows who you are, but... <laughs> well, I've been teaching for 50 years. I've been doing research for 50 years. I have a degree in commercial banking law and commercial law. And I... understand the Uniform Commercial Code. I understand trust law. Does that apply? All these are all these four subjects are related. <clears throat> you have to understand tax law, trust law, commercial law, and accounting. If you don't, you can't understand anything that's going on. And that's part of the problem is when people go into court, you don't know what kind of jurisdiction the court's operating under. So what did you discover about all this stuff that we're doing? How are we doing it wrong? Well, if you go in there, the, these courts are not, these courts have two jurisdictions. They have a, pro, a, a public side, which operates on in commercial, and a private side, which operates under the common law. And their course of contract, if you go in there and contract with them, they got jurisdiction. How do you not contract with them? Well, you make a special appearance. You do, okay. like I did. I did a letter rogatory, and every time I've done one, I've been successful with it. you got to read 3-501 and 3-502. It tells you how to do a conditional acceptance upon proof of claim. You have to challenge their right, and most of these people are making presentments on behalf of somebody else. And they don't ever tell you what their authority to do that is. When they do these loans, that's what they're doing on a mortgage loan. They're making a presentment on behalf of somebody else. Well, they don't have any authority to do that, but if you don't challenge it, then they get away with it. You could kill all these mortgages at the, at the administrative level without ever getting into court. They should never get to court.
What do you do uh, if you're in a, a state that's not judicial, though? They never go to court anyway. What do you do in that case? Well, judicial, like Ohio's a judicial court, they file a complaint against you. I know, it, but in a non-judicial. Okay, well, non-judicial, they... they uh, <clears throat> They do a. Uh, they can't do that. They can't do a non-judicial foreclosure because it's a confessed judgment. The deed of trust contains a confessed judgment, and you can't have. A, that's where they get the power. To, go read the power of sale clause in your deed of trust. Are, are you still there? Yeah, I'm listening to you. Okay, when you when you when it goes into when loan goes into default. They have the right under power of sale. That's a confessed judgment. In California, under 1131 through 1134 of the California Civil Code, you cannot do a confessed judgment on a mortgage loan unless the borrower has consented to it. And that means that he has to file an oath and an order with the court has to be certified by an attorney. All of these deeds of trust contain a confessed judgment. That's number one. Number two is, you're not dealing in a mortgage loan, you're dealing in an investment contract. And they're holding you liable on a contract to which you're not the, not a party, and that's the pooling and servicing agreement. And under the statute of frauds, which is 1624, section 1624 of the California Civil Code, and it's in the Uniform Commercial Code at 2201, section 2201. And the statute of frauds was designed to prevent the very thing that they're doing. And it, the statute of frauds is evidentiary. And if you don't raise it, you waive it. And I don't know of one person who has ever raised the statute of fraud as a defense. It's evidentiary. And the landmark decision on that is, is the Seacrest case. Because when you go to closing, what they're doing is they're, do they're doing a loan modification. Because they made you a party to a contract to which you're not a party to. You're a third party, co you're a third party contractee to the pooling and servicing agreement. And the proof of that is that's where your mortgage payments are going. Your mortgage payments go to the investors as a cash flow claim. They're not going to the servicing company. The servicing company merely passes them on. They pass them on to the investor. Why are they giving them to the investor? <clears throat> Another thing that you need, to, you need to study is you're dealing in securities, not negotiable instruments. What you call a promissory note is the security because it has a, a maturity of more than nine months. All these mortgages have 30-year and 20-year maturities. And if you read Title 15, Section 78, CA 10, it says any note that has a maturity of nine months or less is excluded from the definition of a security because it's not a security, it's a note. Where have you ever seen one promissory note that has a maturity of nine months or less? You, you, you haven't. And they also, there's a disclaimer that's supposed to be in the credit application. Under Title 16, 16 CFR 433.2 which says that the buyer of the the seller takes it subject to all the defenses and claims that the buyer could, as, uh, could assert against any transferee or any buyer who buys it. 
or anybody who sells it. But they take that out of all of these loan applications. None of these mortgage loan applications have that disclaimer in them. That means that you have a deed, so that means there's no holder in due course. Because if you read 3302 of the Uniform Commercial Code, a holder in due course takes it free of all claims and defenses that the payor could have could assert against any payee or assignee or transferee. Well, they don't take it free of that. They take it subject to your claims and defenses. Now, what are the claims and defenses that you have? Well, number one, under 3305, you have a claim in recoupment, which is a counterclaim. And that's the same language that's in Rule 13 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And Rule 13 says there's two types of counterclaims. There's a mandatory counterclaim and a permissive counterclaim. A mandatory claim, counterclaim is a claim that arises from the same transaction and occurrence as the plaintiff's claim. Nobody's filing a counterclaim. That's why they're running over you. You can't be a creditor unless you file a counterclaim. That's under 3305 of the Uniform Commercial Code, or 3-305. And your second claim, or defense, is 3306, which says that you have a proprietary and possessionary and property interest in the note and its proceeds. And you have the right to rescind negotiation of the transaction. Negotiation means the endorsement on the note. They all they always endorse these notes, pay to the order of. Well, you have a right to rescind that negotiation. But you ne nobody ever does it because they don't read the Uniform Commercial Code. I've been teaching for 50 years, and I haven't found anybody in the in the Patriot community that reads that, that reads the Uniform Commercial Code. They don't read all these applicable statutes. And when you have when you're dealing in securities, it's governed by Article Eight, not Article Three, because the, what you call a note is a security and it's a non-negotiable instrument. If you read the adjustable, and most of these subprime mortgages have an adjustable rate rider that goes with the with the note. The just, the adjustable rate rider modifies the conditions of payment and makes it, it says it supplements and governs the promissory note. And if you read 3-106D, it says that it can't be a negotiable instrument if it's subject or governed by a, by extraneous documents outside the, of the promissory note. And they, they make it subject to the adjustable rate rider and the deed of trust. And I have a dozen cases that say all mortgage notes are non-negotiable instruments. Well, they're, if they're not if they're non-negotiable instruments, they're not governed by Article Three. They're governed by general contract law, specifically Restatement of the Law, Second Series, under Contract Section One Sixty Four, which has to do with misrepresentation, which means it's subject to rescission. But nobody ever rescinds anything. If you read two two six point twenty three of TILA, or Regulation Z, that's 12 CFR, that's the Code of Electronic Regulations, Federal Code of Electronic Regulations. You've got to go into the electronic version. And if you go into the appendix, they have a form in there, in Appendix H. They have rescission forms. And they're called H-8 and H-9 in the appendix of 226.23. And if the lender doesn't give you, they not only have to tell you of your right to rescind, but they have to give you the form to do the rescission. That's all in 226.23. Now it says in there that it doesn't apply to residential mortgage loans. But you go down to section H, it says that at foreclosure, you have the right to rescind 
the loan transaction if two things occurred. There was no mortgage broker fee charged and you were given the you weren't given notice of the right to rescind or the appropriate form. Either one of those three things. They didn't give you the form which is in appendix. It's the H eight form. H H dash eight and H dash nine. So you can rescind the transaction when it goes into foreclosure. They'll tell you that you can't you only got seventy two hours. If they didn't give you notice, the, stat, the, the statute of limitations does not toll until they tell you you have a right to rescind. So you can do it at foreclosure. And another thing is you're not in a loan transaction. You're in an investment contract. 4-102 under applicability says if an item is includable in Article 3, it's, it's governed by Article 8. Article 8 governs Article 3. Why does it? Because you're dealing in securities. All these notes are securities, not notes or negotiable instruments. So Article 8 governs 3 and 4, and that's what it says. And what you have to do is you have a claim in, in recoupment or a claim under 3306 to the proceeds and a right to rescind the negotiation and you have a possessionary and property right in the proceeds of the investment contract. But nobody ever files a claim. And if you read 8-505 through 8-508, it tells you how to file a claim. And the claim is called an adverse claim. And it's defined in 8 dash 102 and it's defined in 8 dash 105 of article 8. Nobody uses article 8 and all these mortgage transactions are governed by article 8 not article 3 or article 2. They're all governed by article 8 and you have a counterclaim. You never file the counterclaim. That's why when they go into foreclosure they file a 1099-A saying that you abandon your claim, your recoupment, which is a counterclaim, and your possessionary right to the proceeds from the sale of the security under the investment contract to which you are an undisclosed third party. And nobody understands that. You're an undisclosed third party to a contract under the statute of frauds. And if they're going to hold you liable under a contract which you're an undisclosed third party and, you're, and, you, and it hasn't been subscribed to by you or memorialized, then you have a right to the proceeds from the transaction. And nobody files a counterclaim going after the proceeds. And it tells you how to do that. And nobody's doing that. That's one of the reasons that, you, that you're losing in court. A, the, another reason you're losing in court is because none of these courts, and I mean none, you know what I mean by N-O-N-E? None of these okay. courts have subject matter jurisdiction over land, only a land court. And in Florida, the only land courts are your county courts, and it says that in the Constitution. If you go into the judiciary of the Florida Constitution and look up Article 5, Section 20, it tells you what courts are have jurisdiction. And your county courts have jurisdictions over land. None of these courts. So what you do is you go in there and contract with people that don't have subject matter jurisdiction. None of these attorneys, these attorneys don't have they don't have jurisdiction to represent anybody. And if you go read the dead man statutes, which they pa passed under probate law, your dead man statutes were codified under Rule 601 of the Federal Rules of, of Evidence. And what it says, it goes to competency to testify. They're incompetent to testify on behalf of a dead person. Now, who is the dead person? 
It's all of these corporations. They're all decedents. They're dead persons because they're not real. And what the attorney does is you let them come in there and they start testifying on behalf of all these banks. And if you don't raise the objection, that's the first thing I do. I am before this court by special appearance without waiving any rights, remedies, or defenses, statutory or, statutory or procedural. I put that admonition at the top of my pleadings. That way you don't waive jurisdiction. Otherwise, you're going in there and contracting with, this, with these people. You contract with them, and then when they rule against you, even though they didn't have subject matter jurisdiction, you gave them that. You gave them jurisdiction, but not subject matter. But you got to raise it. And nobody raises subject matter in impersona. In order to for the court to have jurisdiction, the plaintiff has to be there, and the defendant. You have to have both parties, real parties and interests that have standing. Under Article 3, Section 2, standing is a threshold issue, and the court is supposed to address that sua sponte, but they're not doing it. Some of them do, and some of them don't. So you have the responsibility to bring that up, because that's a threat. standing is a threshold issue. None of these servicing companies that are foreclosing on all these loans None of them have standing to come into court and foreclose on your loan. And the reason is because they don't own the loans. Who owns the security? The borrower does. That's why this Countrywide, in the Kemp case, this woman from, who's an employee of Countrywide came in and testified in court that none of the notes are transferred. That means that all of these real estate investment trusts, which they call REMIX, don't have the notes. And April Charney, if you read her admonitions on this, she says that they never transfer the notes, nor do they sell them. They keep the notes. And the reason they keep them, and the reason they, they keep them is because they don't own them. They can't transfer them. And if they did transfer them, they have to do that to get the exemption, otherwise they have to pay taxes. If they don't pay out 90% of their taxable income in interest and dividends to the investors, then they have a tax liability. And they do not qualify under Section 862 and 852 of Title 26 as a real estate investment trust. So they're in possession of contraband. So what they're doing is billing you for the tax that they owe. And everybody goes in, nobody raises this issue because they don't understand it. That's why every mortgage is a tax issue. It actually involves two things. It involves an investment contract and a tax. And the reason the tax comes into play is because they never transferred the security. They kept these securities. So that means that all these investors that bought, that bought cash flow claims under the pooling and servicing agreement have got worthless paper. That means there's a cloud on every title and none of these notes were ever securitized. That means every B-5 prospectus, an S-3 registration statement, an 8K current report is, are all invalid that are filed with the Securities Exchange Commission because they, the notes, the, the securities were never transferred at closing. And these investors put up all of this capital, and <clears throat> I have a law review article written by David Levithan that goes into the ramifications of this. That means that the banks that allegedly financed all these loans are gonna have to give all this money back to the investors as class flow claims because they never transferred. They bought something that they never got. They paid for all these notes or securities and they were never transferred to them. So they don't own any of them. So the banks are going to have to give and there's not enough money in all of the banks to pay these investors back. So what
what does that mean? So you're going to have a putback, and that's what this 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 professor that wrote this article went up and testified before Congress on the on the the, the sub finance committee under community housing. He testified before Congress what's going to happen if Congress doesn't do something. Now, what are they going to do? It's going to be remains to be seen. But I'm telling you what the ramifications of this are. China probably is going to come in here and buy up all of the, all of this all of these loans, and that means or either that or they'll bail out everybody. Either that or they'll confiscate all your money in the banks. One of those two things is going to happen. You stand by and watch. And in response to the young lady that asked about the 1099 OID, all these people that are going around filing 1099 OIDs, 1096s, 1040, 1040Vs, they're not filing 8281s. An 8281 identifies who the issuer of the OID is under Title 10, Section 78CA8. That's a small c, 78C, small a, parentheses 8, the number 8. Go read it. It identifies you as the issuer. And because you didn't identify yourself as the issuer, you don't have a claim. That's why it says in publication 1212 on page 2 that you it must the 8281 form must be filed when you file the OID. This is what this this is what happens when people don't read anything. They're listening to what other people are telling them. And people are not reading these publications. That's why the IRS public, publishes these publications because they tell you how to file for an OID original issue discount and it tells you what forms you have to file also if you read your deed of trust and this is in every deed of trust under payments which in almost all of them is number three and if you go read it if you don't believe me this is what I mean by nobody reads anything. People complain about all this lack of disclosure, but they never read the deed of trust, and it tells you what they're doing. And it tells you that if there's any money owed at maturity, you can pay it at maturity. So let me ask you a question. How can the note be in default if you have the right by contract, the deed of trust is a contract, and you signed the deed of trust. How can they foreclose on the note when you can make the, any delinquent payment at maturity on the note under the deed of trust? So how can the how can the mortgage be in in uh, foreclosure? Default. How can it be in default? You ever heard that before? Yeah. No. Read every word, every word, every sentence, every phrase. It's an unconscionable contract. It has clogging provisions in it. You know what clogging is? Clogging provisions are provisions that extinguish your equity of redemption. If they sell your security, how are you going to redeem it if they sell it to somebody else and give you the note back? Don't you always have the, the right to redeem a loan? That's war proof that it's not a loan, it's an investment contract. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, hold on one second. Let me bring up the questions. Ohio. Go ahead, Ohio. Did you have a question? Ohio. <laughs> oh, 
Ohio, are you there? Ohio. No, we did. Ohio. We forgot to mute. We want to mute. Oh, okay. Star six. Oh, is yeah. Star six. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. All right, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Hi, Angela. I have a question for Jean. Go right ahead. Gene, uh, there's been another gentleman on the internet recently talking about what he calls your ABCs. His name happens to be Patrick Devine. Are you familiar with him by chance? Yeah, he's one of my students. He, oh, well, I happen to think, sir, that he is probably dead on what's going on. And evidently, you, you must agree if you say he's your student. I haven't seen what he's teaching lately, so I don't know if he, if he what he's teaching. So, well, it's going along with exactly what you're saying. Is it possible that I can send you some information for you to review? Sure. Fantastic. If I could get your email, if someone would type, Angela, would you be kind enough to type an email in for me in the chat so I can send Gene some information, and then I have another question. Uh. Gene, you, you talk about a form. Uh, what was the form you were just talking about that must go in with the 1099 OID? It was an 88-something? 82. 82, 81. There's three forms. Okay. All you have to do is follow the 82, 81, but you should read the instruction booklet on the 82, 81. There's an 82, 82, and an 82, 83. I su I'm suggesting that you read all three of them. Okay. Now, another question for you. Let me bring let me bring something to your attention. attention. And this yes, is, sir. This is really powerful. In nineteen fifty one they passed the law under Title twenty six, section twenty thirty eight, and section twenty five fourteen. It's called the Power of Appointment Act of nineteen fifty one. The donor has total power. Every one of these mortgage loan transactions is a donor-donee relationship, which means it's a class five gift and estate tax under the 60209 decoding manual. If you go to the IRS website and download it, it's called the IRS Processing Manual of 2010. If you go in there and read it, it tells you that all 1096s, all 1098s, all 1040s, all 1099s, all W-2s, are you guys getting this? All W-2s, all W-4s are class five gift and estate taxes. But they have nothing to do with an income tax. And everybody's filing 1040 forms. You don't report gift and estate taxes on a 1040 form. You report income on a 1040. That's number one. All class five gift and estate taxes are done on a 706 form or a 709. On a 706 form, it's a generation skipping transfer tax. You should read the instruction booklet on a 706. I go into this stuff in my classes, and we have classes every Tuesday night. And this is some of the stuff that I cover. You have, an, under the 709 form, which is a gift tax form. See, there's two types of taxes, generation skipping transfer tax, which is what the 706 is for, and a gift tax, which is what the 709 is for. And if you go read publication 950, you have a $3,500,000 unified tax credit. That means if you know anything about accounting, corporations, use that $3,500,000 as money. Corporations use tax credits as money. They actually will give tax credits to banks and banks will loan money on the tax credits. You have a $3,500,000 unified tax credit under publication 950 on all estate taxes. You have a $1,000,000 unified tax credit or exclusion on the gift side. 
And they build that, and if you read the 709 form, they build the exclusion. You have a, a it's a $348,000, and it's built into the form. It's actually in the form. And I know that none of you wage owners that, that have wages make more than $348,000. Uh, What's wrong with this picture? Uh, so, okay, first off, I'd like to say this is that now he's, he, Patrick talks about it being very important every time you send in your 1099A for acquisition or abandonment that you have to send in a Form 56. Yeah, you point a fiduciary. Right, so is the is the Form 56 and this Form 8281, are they somewhat maybe similar? No. Oh, oh, okay. So, the 8281 so identifies you as the issuer of the OID. Okay. That's why they're penalizing people on these OIDs. Oh, okay. Let, now, let, let me ask you, if you would, here for me. I go back to, I always go back to McFadden's speech on the floor of the House in the 1930s, sir. And he says, Mr. Speaker, if this bill becomes law, a Scottish distiller will be able to draw up his bill and present it to the Federal Reserve window and have his money before he ever produces the whiskey. Now, I didn't write that, sir, but that is what it says. Then that means that each and every one of us are running a corporation we on this end have tended to call that the straw man, but it's a business. And we have the ability then to draw up our bill and send it to the Federal Reserve window and get our money every year before we ever start doing business in our particular businesses that we might call uh, Gene Keating all caps or Angela Stark all caps or whatever. Am I wrong, sir? No, you're absolutely right. I can show you how to do that. So every single one of us have the power individually, individually, without going and getting involved in a big group. If we just learn how to run our banks, we have the ability to take back and inherit what the Bible might call the kingdom of God. Would you argue with that? You're absolutely right. Okay. So, in other words, what, it, what, what the wizard told Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, Oz was, all you had to do is click your heels together. The remedy's been with you the whole time. Would you agree with that? Yes, it has. Okay. So it sounds to me like, uh, I, I tell you what I would love to see, sir. I would love to see you and Patrick get together. It sounds like he's using your information and strengthen this thing so each and every one of us can finally find our remedy because it's been withheld from us for, for years and years and years because my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Would you disagree with that? Nope. That's fantastic. We have special drawing rights on the IMF. Did you know that? Well, that sounds to me like what I'm saying is all we have to do is take our... I know you can go to the Small Business Administration today. My folks did it and in their business and you can present up a plan to them, a business plan, and they'll fund the plan. I just never realized that they were just, all they were doing was taking your social security number as the account number and they're going through there and funding the thing because we have that right because we're creditors to the corporation. That's right. What, all of these corporations are debtors in possession under Chapter 11 reorganization. And each and every one of us are the creditors to the United States. Am I correct, sir? Yes. Okay. So each and every one of us have had our remedy, and we're sitting around bitching and moaning and complaining and crying about what Obama and all these people are doing, and they don't mean diddly squat to us. Every one of us has got our remedy right this minute, and it's as easy as A, B, C. 1099 A's, B's, and C's, and if you know how to use them, you can run your whole bank because it says we're each one of us bankers under Title 31 of the United States Code. Am I correct, sir? Yeah. Okay. So we all have our remedy. We just have to quit being stupid. Am I correct? Amen. Okay. I'll get off the call and let someone else talk. Thank you for your time very much, and thank you, Angela. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, we'll move on. Let's see. Texas, go ahead. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Hey, what's going hey. on? Hi. Hey, 
Um, I did a 1099 ORD uh, for the last so four years, and um, for 2006, seven, and eight, um, you said that I need to do a form 8281. How do I fill out the form for a checking account or a savings account? That's what all I did. The 1099 ORD um, was my money of uh, uh, equity. You need to read sections 1271 through 1288 of Title 26. Everything is an OID because it's a public debt instrument. Okay. So, like, I'm looking at the. When you, look at, when you, when you write a check, it's a public debt instrument. Right. Okay. You, you you issue it as, a, as an original issue discount or a withdrawal. Okay. But, for example, on this 8281 form, you have to have a QCIP number. That's what. That's why you, all you guys are doing, everybody that's doing redemption is doing it wrong. When they send you a bill, you know what they're doing? You know what the bill represents that they send you? A uh, presentment or... I don't know. It represents the amount of, amount of your credit that they're using. All right, all right. Okay, you have to file a tax return and assess the tax. That's why they never redeemed the debt, because you never assessed it, because it's a tax. And you're the only one that can assess it because it's your credit they're using. If you don't report it as income to the IRS, how is the IRS going to give you a refund? So that's where the 1099-RID comes in. I reported that income. No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. You do a pay order on the bill. Pay to the order of the Department of Treasury. Charge the sum said to the person that sent you the bill, the utility company. Then say cre credit or uh, uh, credit it to the, then put, you put credit to your account and put your social security number there. But that sounds like uh, A for B. Look a little bit. Well, it's not an A for B. It's a it's a money order. Okay. You're paying the, the tax to the IRS, and then the IRS can turn around and bill the account of the person that sent you the bill. You're not doing that, so they're billing you for it. They're double dipping. They go into your account and get the money, and then they send you the coupon, which is a check. And you never use the coupon, you send it back to them. So they take the coupon and they keep these coupons. And they're, they're, they're a check. That's a check. Plus the check you sent to them, you paid them twice. They're getting paid twice for every transaction they do with you. If you think that isn't what's going on, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. They assessed an $80,000 fine on me. The district court, court did. I did a pay to the order of it. I never heard of from them again. They have to pay the tax on eighty thousand dollars. Remember, every bill is a tax bill. Okay, so you said that I would take each bill uh, that they send me, do a pay to the order of, and I send it to the IRS. Yeah, and pay IRS. you send the you send the uh, the original to the IRS, and you send a copy to the person that sent you the bill. Along with a 1040B, a 1040, and a 1096, and an OID. A 1040? And, yeah. Oh, wow. You put that in there, it's income. Okay. And you're reporting it to the IRS as income. How and many 1040s are you saying you can file in a year, Gene? Well, it depends on how many transactions you have. <laughs> I thought you so can I only do one 1040 for the year. Well, you can wait and do it at the end of the year. Put all your transactions on one form. Okay, I, I need to look at an example, an example of that because that's, uh, <laughs> I guess it sounds pretty simple, but, you know, that's a lot of stuff. Well, you, you just know. have to understand what's going on. It's right. your money they're using, and you're not reporting it. Right. Just like, so, who, who reports, who keeps track of, when you write a check, don't you keep a record of the check you wrote? 
Right, yes, I do. Okay. Well, you, okay. how are you going to balance, who balances your check, your checking account? You do. Right. Okay. Well, the IRS can't balance your account, credit account, unless you file a return. Reporting the income. You have to do it because it's your income. Right. Okay, so for my situation where I have already filed a 1099 ID and the IRS is coming back to me saying that I have to correct what I did, or I'll get a $5,000 penalty. How do, do pay I the order on their bill. Do you know the IRS has a DUNS number? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Right, I've heard that before. Well, it's true. I got their DUNS number. I know what their DUNS number is. Okay, but, uh, okay. What they're, tr what they're doing is they're trying to find out if you know what you're doing or not. Right. And everybody goes into panic power. Oh my God, the IRS is after me. <laughs> it's time to run for the hills. Right. They're, they're testing you to see if you know what you're doing. Okay, Never so. Fails. They, they don't do anything. They, so on it, they don't do anything. They're telling you that they're they're double dipping. Okay. So uh, do I still send in the eighty two eighty one in this case since I've already sent in to ten I or okay I'm Yeah, I fill out an eighty two eighty one and send it in. You're not an issuer unless you file an eighty two eighty one. Because the, the 12, publication twelve twelve says you must. Must means mandatory. Must okay. file an 8281. But I have met one person that even knows what an 8281 is. Right. That's because nobody's reading anything. Nobody, right. everybody's going around listening to what everybody's telling everybody. They listen to Winston Shroud, Gordon Hall, Jack Smith, Tim Turner. Nobody goes out and, and, and does any research and reads anything. That's why they don't don't uh, uh, know what's going on. Okay. These courts, so, none of these courts have jurisdiction to do anything. They're not courts; right. they're privately owned trading companies. And I don't go in their contract with. I make I make a contract with them, on the private side, and then I control it by conditional acceptance. If you do a condi conditional acceptance right, you can blow them out of the water. I stopped a $60,000 car loan by writing a letter to the judge. He not only took the case off the calendar, he dismissed the motion for default judgment and the motion for an order for writ of possession. Dismissed both of them and took the case off the calendar. Okay. All right, so for... Got to go on the private you're going in there on the public side with courts that have no jurisdiction. Even though they don't have jurisdiction, you're contracting with them. And you give them jurisdiction by contract. <clears throat> they can contract with you, and that's what they... Uh, I don't go in there and contract with them. Okay. I said, where's your authority? I'll accept that on proof of claim. Where do you, where do you get to... What's your authority for making a presentment on behalf of somebody else. And 99.9% .9 of these people are making presentments on behalf of somebody else. And do, do they ever, when these banks on a mortgage foreclosure, when they make a presentment, do they ever send you the note? Did you know that they have to present the instrument too? Not only do they have to tell you their authority for making the presentment on behalf of somebody else, and they're all doing it, but they have to give you the the instrument. They have to exhibit the instrument. Do you ever make them exhibit the instrument? Nope. Did you know that if you get the abstract of title, and I think the title companies are holding these, that, that, that the loan was paid in full at closing? It actually says that? They're called title papers? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh the uh, title company has those? Yeah, they have the abstract of title, which is a record 
of the deeds and the notes and all of your loan papers, where they've been, wh wh who's using them. It keeps a record of this. The title company has all this. So I'll, I'll ask the title company for the aspect of title. Yeah, t tell them you want to know who the errors and omissions. Who's holding the insurance policies on errors and omissions? Did you know you have an error and omission claim on all these mortgage loans? Mm -hmm. No. Did you know that under the under RESPA, they cannot receive any kickback on a mortgage loan, on a federally funded mortgage loan, and all these loans are federally funded? They call them mortgage loans. I'm calling them what they call them. They're really investment contracts. But they violate RESPA, and that's an errors and omissions claim, which you can collect on. Okay. You need to come to my class on Tuesday night. We have right. we have four. We're gonna we're gonna have more classes on Tuesday night. We have a class, and I go into all this stuff. Right, right. I'll definitely be there. Um, but as far as this eighty two eighty one, uh, for example, the acoustic number, do I put in my social security number or? Yeah, the issue date, the maturity date, the type of instrument. Uh, I'm looking at the fields of like, okay, well, how do I actually fill them out, you know? You mean the 8281? Yes. Well, it, it, uh, let, me, let me pull one up here. This is how you identify who the issuer is. Right. And you're not you're not doing that. Information returned for publicly offered original issue discount instruments. You know what for Apple one oh four says? Say that again. For Apple 104 of the Uniform Commercial Code, do you know what it says? No. It says originator, it defines what an originator is. Originator of the first funds transfer. Okay. It, when you go read 3105 of the Uniform Commercial Code, it tells you who the issue is and who the issuer is. And it says under subsection C, and so under subsection A, it defines what the issue is. That's the first payment order on a funds transfer. Number C defines what issuer is. And it says an issuer is the drawer and the maker. Now, if you've got a mortgage and you sign a mortgage note, you're an issuer by legal definition. Does that tell you anything? What did you sign? You endorsed the security. Well, don't you have a proprietary interest in the proceeds from the sale of that security? That they're making you a party to the investment contract? Absolutely. Well, so why aren't you claiming it? We will be now. <laughs> Do you understand why people are not winning in court? That's an Article 8 claim, adverse claim. Go look up what an adverse claim is. You know, here, I'll, I'll read it to you. Let me pull up the UCC and I'll read it to you. And you can see how this thing works. Cool. This is what I go into on, on my classes. I'm giving you manna. This is manna from heaven. But they said manna didn't have any taste to it. Well, this doesn't. <laughs> this is this is uh, uh, this is all. Uh, this is all manna. And definitely, I'm going to go into the definitions. It says an adverse claim. And this is 8-102, 
Subsection A1, adverse claim, means a claim that a claimant has a property interest in a financial asset and that it is a violation of the rights of the claimant for another person to hold, transfer, or deal with the financial asset. Okay, now go down to 8-109, 8-102, subsection 9. It says a financial asset is a security. Well, so you've got a uh, you've got a, a property interest in a financial asset. Isn't that what three three hundred six says? Property interest. Mm -hmm. And when you go to 8-105, you have security. It says a person has notice of an adverse claim if the person knows of the adverse claim. Don't you think they know that you have an adverse claim? So they already had notice of it at closing. And don't, aren't they aware of facts sufficient to, to indicate that there is a significant probability that the adverse claim exists and it deliberately avoids the information that would establish evidence of the adverse claim? Don't they have a duty imposed by statute or regulation to investigate whether an adverse claim exists? And don't they have knowledge that a financial asset or interest therein in or has been transferred? All of this, 8-105. And then you go to 8-505, it tells you how to file the claim. Oh, they're going to love me. Right. This is what you call love at first sight. I'm going to have to uh, listen to this call again anyway. But um, You funded the whole thing. If you read uh, on the Internet, they have an affidavit written by Neil Garfield. It goes into this whole thing. The only thing that that, that he's not correct in, is he says the, the money came from the investors on a pay what they call a pay forward. In other words, before they ever had a lend, before they ever had a borrower in place, they had the capital. So the the investors put up the capital for these real real estate investment trusts before they ever had a mortgage loan. But they did it under uh, on on the condition that you put up a security doesn't that make you the creditor wasn't the the, money, the capital that the investor put put up predicated on the security that you gave to the to the servicing company at closing right. you your bippy it was so aren't you didn't you give them the, the instrument or the capital for the investor's money it wasn't right. The, the 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 pay forward done by the investors before there was ever a loan in place? Yeah, but the investors' money didn't really go to my security. What it went to was for the bankers and lenders to buy uh, insurance and credit default swaps and to fund their uh, a pool of money so they can pay back the investors. Yeah, but they put that capital based on your security that you issued. That gives you a proprietary interest in it. Okay. If you went through all the securities from this uh, pooling and servicing agreement and from the trust fund, what would they have? Nothing. So they didn't have the right to the investor's money if they didn't have my security. That's right. They would have never put the capital up in the first place unless they were guaranteed a, 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 a capital from the borrower. So the borrower has a proprietary interest in the proceeds from the security. But you're not making the claim. And that's why they put the the disclaimer in 16 CFR 433.2. Go read it. They take it subject to all the defenses and claims that you can assert against the seller. Well, they're not they can't be a holder because a holder takes it free of all defenses and claims. So they're not holders in due course. Well, if they're not a holder in due course, what does 3-305 say? 
Let's go read it. You wonder why you're losing in court? Read S305. Because we're not treating it as a contract. Defenses and claims and recoupment. Recoupment. That means counterclaim. Go look it up. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm definitely going to have to listen to this call again, like I said, and uh, go through all that stuff. But if you go read C, read that 305C, it says an obligor is not obliged to pay the instrument if the person seeking enforcement of the instrument does not have rights of a holder in due course. What does that tell you? If they're taking it subject to your claims and defenses, are they a holder in due course? Right. Oh, no. Well, doesn't that say you don't have to pay it? Right. Well, so why are they why are they foreclosing on your property when they're not a holder in due course? Because they're still in the property. Because you're not raising the defense. That's why. When you're not in a land court, you're in a privately owned trading company. Private owned trading company, okay. In California, you know where the county courts are in California? Go read your constitution. Okay. I haven't re I haven't looked it up yet, but the, 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 do they have county courts in California? Yeah, they do. Okay, where they? You know where they're located? Well, I would, I would assume that's like where you fight tickets and things like that. Those are the only courts that have jurisdiction over land. None of these courts have jurisdiction over land, and nobody's bringing this up. They go in there, and and, and, the, and these courts are, are running over them. When she washes your car, don't let her walk on your roof. That's how we have to wash all the stuff off. And make sure you have insurance so if she falls off your car, she won't sue you. 